Anything we should be worrying about before we get rolling? This is the five minute preamble before uh, the rubber hits the road. Any business we should take care of uh, beforehand? You know your first assignment is due tomorrow at midnight, right? So don't forget that. Um, next week's Labor Day, so we don't have class on Monday, but you do have to look at a, one of the videos. And if you wish, uh, I guess if you wish, you can look at one of the videos. And if you wish, you can get one third of a percent for doing the quiz that's associated with that. Sorry. All will be revealed in the, uh, the announcement that I send out on uh, Friday morning. Anything else? Anything else going okay? Who hasn't looked at uh, the exams yet? Okay. Should do. That's okay. Why? Well, it's not for me. <laughs> do it for yourself. <laughs> so I think it's uh, useful to look at that. And as we get through material, uh, you should start thinking about uh, working your way through the. Uh, the blind, maybe, and just making sure you know how to do them. So I think that's useful. All right. What are we going to talk about? Lighting good for everybody? Everyone can see from the back who needs to see? Of course, if you can't see from the back, you could always move forward. I know that's a strange concept. <laughs> There's some attraction with the back, I think, right? But you don't have people going all the way to the back. So, no. I was interested to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen. What do we have? Fifty-ish, maybe? Fifty. So the class, I think, is 204 right now or so. So, um, this is just a little preamble. I think this is kind of interesting. If you looked at anything on the YouTube site, my YouTube site, I'm kind of happy that I have um, 270,000 views. And so this is a, a, a video put together, I think, by a couple of high school kids, or may, maybe even grade school kids, which has 4.7 million views, which I think is interesting, just on uh, one, uh, uh, one movie, as opposed to all of my stuff. Which is, So I think that's kind of uh, sobering, maybe, in, in some respects. But this looks like a high school project with a GoPro camera, uh, oops, uh, put on a balloon, lofted into uh, space until it gets as high as it can. I think what we just saw was, a, uh, was the remnants of the balloon dropping away and it now f falling. Yeah, I guess that's it. That's the balloon shattering. And then the recovery phase, I suppose, is uh, going down to Earth, hopefully with an address on it. And if someone finds it, then they send it to you. And so I presume that's the, the mode of recovery. And you hope that it's... Uh, it lands on, on land rather than an inhabited land rather than in the, the sea. So there it is. So, and so all of these things have some kind of relevance, and so we'll go back to it over time. What else do we have going on? What's going on in the news right now? Well, of course, uh, I keep on wanting to call it Hurricane Harry, but it's Hurricane Harvey. It's coming on land again in um, Louisiana this time. Much better than 12 years ago in terms of loss of life and damage than Katrina, which was 12 years ago today, by the way, I believe. Um, and we talked a little bit about the expected so storm surge that was supposed to accompany this, which is supposed to be uh, 12 feet or so. And so we mentioned the last time that you might want to calculate whether that 12 feet could be due to, for instance, barometric effects. And so maybe that's the first thing we'll think about today. Did anyone try and do a calculation? Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, so, well, so I put up a wiki page just to see exactly what I mean by barometric effects. Now, what I mean by barometric effects is that you know that um, hurricanes, of course, are fluid dynamic problems, right? Swirling air above the ocean, fed by thermal energy from the sea, fed by moisture, and also driven by the circulation pattern on the face of the Earth and the, and the motion of the Earth, which gives us our winds, of course. But the main feature of it, of course, is that as warm air rises, it creates low pressure. And low pressure in the center, we know that atmospheric pressure is something of the order of 101 kilopascals. Um, and the minimum pressures within the strongest hurricanes 
are something like this would be 89 kilopascals if you do the, the, uh, the conversion. So these are millibars. Uh, and so, yeah, these are 900 millibars. So it goes down to 900 millibars. 1,000 millibars is a bar, right? One, one barometer, one barometric pressure unit, I guess, which is one bar. And so it's 0.9 of um, 101 kPa. And so that maybe is an interesting starting point as we start thinking about what we'll carry on with today. And as always, we'll try and do a little bit of a, uh, a recap on some things as we go along. So let's come back to that in a second. So the things we talked about last time, you remember, you'll never have to derive these, but you'll remember that we ended up with three equations. Um, and these are, the, uh, if you like, the flow equations. And I'll just write them out again because I can. They're actually the same ones that are written right here. But let me write them out again. It was something like minus a change in pressure in the z direction minus a unit weight of the fluid. Should check. Minus density times the acceleration in the z direction is equal to zero. And so that's the component that's resolved in the z direction. Um, there was one that represents the change in pressure in the y direction. There is no unit weight in the, acting in that direction. And the density is multiplied by an acceleration in the y direction. So there's some symmetry in these relationships. So this is by resolving in the y direction. And a rate of pressure change in the x direction. Again, acceleration in the x direction. Is that density kind of acceleration? Rho, yes, density. Yep. Uh, and x. And if you remember, I won't draw it quite as nicely as we did it last time, but we did this by just considering a bucket that contains fluid. That bucket just happened to be to have lengths on it which were coincident with the positive axes of our coordinate system. So this was dy, this was dz, that doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that it was basically a balance between the weight of the material, which is embodied in this component, and the pressures which are acting on the surfaces. Remember that this was P plus DP. So I don't actually want to rederive it again, but just notice the points. So what are the main points? Well, one main point is that we said that this is equal to oops, let's write that slightly differently. It's basically that expression here. So F equals ma. It's Newton's second law. It's defining the forces that act on the system, which are due to either pressures or the weight of the bucket, and any accelerations that we happen to put that bucket through. And so one acceleration might be if we accelerate it upwards, it's some acceleration in the z direction. In other words, I don't have anything to use, but if we take that bucket and I push it, not at constant velocity, not this, accelerating it, that's the force that's applied on the container that has a fluid in it. So we're still talking about fluid statics, uh, but we're talking about accelerations. And importantly from this expression, the only things that we need to use right now are going to be the fact that, well, one thing, some of you mentioned afterwards that what's, how do we make this move from partial derivatives to ordinary de derivatives? Well, these are partial derivatives, but they're also ordinary derivatives because this is just taken as a constant. So there is one, only one variable here in this equation, dpdz. So it's also a OGE as well as a PDE. So that probably doesn't matter. But we ended up with three, three behaviors from this. The first is that if we just ignore these accelerations for now, then we have initially 
this. And this was the change in pressure with vertical direction is equal to minus unit weight, which is the same as rho g, density times gravity. We note that the z direction is up, and so that if we plot this, this is merely saying that if we have a coordinate system that looks like this, that the fluid pressure distribution is given by this. And we said that we can also write this as this, where this is dp and this is dz. Right? This is just the slope of this graph, which is the unit weight. So that was one thing that came out of it. And we said something about incompressible fluids and compressible fluids last time that results from this. The second component is that the changes in pressure as we go both in the x and the y direction are equal to zero. And we explain that just by this diagram that if we look at, for instance, Defining pressure with depths, this is minus z. Then the pressure distribution will look like this here. If we go on some length away from here and look at the pressure distribution again, it will look exactly the same. And so as we go across here by definition, since the pressure at this depth is equal to this magnitude, PZ1, let's call this Z1, and also here, this will be the same, PZ1 also. Then this is just saying that as you go horizontally in a fluid, and you can get from this point here, you can get from this point here to this point here in the same fluid without going through another fluid. In other words, you can get there. It's always going to be the same pressure. That's all that this, this expression means. And something we didn't derive, but maybe you take on trust, is that the pressure at a point is equal. The pressure in the x direction is the same as the pressure in the y direction, is the same as the pressure in the z direction. So in other words, if you look at pressure at a point, all these magnitudes are just the same magnitude. So those are the three messages that we, we took from last time. The first two we derive, the, the third one we uh, take on trust. And so what we could do with that is, so this, um, the issue of how big can the storm surge be driven by barometric pressure is the exposition, if you like, of this. I need a bit more space, so I'm going to do it up here. So you take uh, a sea surface, and it's horizontal. You take the middle of the hurricane, and the hurricane is at 90 kilopascals, 0.9 of a bar, maybe um, 100 kilometers outside of that, the pressure is 1 millibar. So in other words, the pressure that we see here. So what you think that would do to a sea surface, well, we know that as you go horizontally within a fluid from here to this point here, this is the same elevation. It has to be the same pressure. So by definition, the pressure here, if it's 100 kPa here, the pressure here has to be 100 kPa And so if we go from here to here, we have to be at 90 kPa. So this distance here has to be a change of 10 kilopascals. And just by inspection, if you like, we know that one meter of water, the unit weight is equal to 10 kilopascals per meter cubed, 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So if we know that from what we talked about last time, that the pressure is equal to the depth times the unit weight, then in our case, if this depth is one meter, 
times 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed, we end up with 10 kPa. So basically, the storm surge that you can get from this magnitude of this, the, you know, the, the lowered pressure in the center of a storm, which is a tenth of a bar, 10 kPa, is about one meter of water. And so if you get in 12 meters, then it can't be due to that. And so there has to be some other mechanism. And the main mechanism is that you have this thing swirling, and you have the air, the wind pushing on the, the sea, and kind of piling it up like a bulldozer by scraping the top against the, the sea walls. So simple hypothesis. Can it be driven by bar barometric pressure alone? doesn't look like it can, so it must be something else, and then you have to explore what the other components would be. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so, yeah, so just by the, the unit. So 1 kPa, one, sorry, 1 Pascal, by definition, is 1 Newton per meter squared, just by just different name. So I shouldn't switch between them, but they are the same. Just You'll get used to it. All right, so that's that. Where else? What else are we going to do? Uh, we talked about a balloon. Uh, we could talk about, well, yes, come back to talking about a balloon. All right, everyone okay with that? So you'll remember that last time, so this is the recap. So sometimes uh, this is how it's written in the book, for instance, those expressions that we just talked about. We just said that we're going to make these accelerations go away for now. And these are the other expressions that we, uh, we used. Um, so that follows from that. Last time we took this expression and we did two things with it. This is always correct. We said that last time, always. But it matters whether the fluid is incompressible liquid, low compressibility liquid. When we integrate this, we get an expression like this that says that the pressure at any point is equal to reference pressure multiplied by the depth we go down uh, multiplied by unit weight. This is just the calculation we did for the liquid in the storm surge. So this is what we just used. And if it's a compressible fluid, it gets a bit more complicated because now the pressure that we have we know that pressure is equal to um, density times RT. And the net effect of that is if we take this relationship here, which is change in pressure is equal to minus unit weight times dz, which is just rearranging this equation here, <coughs> we realize that the density here is actually a function of pressure. And so if we rearrange this into density is equal to pressure divided by RT, and then we, whoops, not for the G, right? And then we substitute it into this and rearrange it. We did this last time. We rearranged it as equal to dp divided by p is equal to gravity, gas constant, absolute temperature, times dz. I'm not going to do this, and then we integrate it. So we did that last time. So, and if we did that, we ended up with an expression that gave us how pressure changed with elevation. So let's go back to that. So everyone hopefully is okay with this. This is really the recap from last time. So what we could do is we could look at how pressure changes as we go up and down in the atmosphere. And I guess I will make the point that last time, you know, the stuff we did just by writing things down took care of all this stuff here. I'm going through it backwards, of course, but all this stuff here, which is a, a more tortuous derivation, I think. And so we got there much, much more simply. So you should thank me for that. I <laughs> know I won't get much thanks, but... Um, you're welcome. Oh, you're, you're the man. <laughs> okay. So this is exactly what we did last time. I, I guess we did it last time. This is the expression we came up with last time. Yeah. This is exactly the expression we came up with last time. So this is the fact that if you look at what we're dealing with, and maybe it's worthwhile uh, recapping this, is if we choose our coordinate system, uh, I 
didn't do it any better. And I'm going to draw pressure versus elevation. This is positive. This is negative. And let's say that this is uh, sea level here. And let's say that this is a pressure of atmospheric pressure. 101 kilopascals, which is the same as 101 kilonewtons per meter cube. Kilo is just multiplier of 10 to the 3, right? You know that. Sorry? Thank you. Love the dialogue, man. Love it. So, in the subsurface, below the water, then this again is, what is this? Uh, we know that change in pressure over elevation is equal to unit weight over 1. So this is going to be unit weight of water, and this is going to be 1, by definition. And we know that if we come down here, this magnitude here is 0 kPa, absolute. So this is 100 kPa absolute pressure relative to abs zero pressures where is outer space. And so we know from what we did last time, we didn't plot it, but let's plot it today, is that our expression is going to look like this. It's going to asymptote towards this number here. And again, at each of these locations, this is going to be equal to 1. And this is going to be equal to the unit weight of air. And the whole reason that it changes is that here at sea level, we have a bunch of air on top of us that compresses the air, so it's about one kilogram per cubic meter. As you go up to the top of Everest and uh, beyond the atmosphere, it's much less. It goes basically to zero uh, as it potters out. <clears throat> There's always an interesting calculation to do. It's in one of these, well, a, a book that says, calculate how many molecules of nitrogen are on the planet in the atmosphere. Very easy calculation to do, right? You know what the mass of um, nitrogen above you, basically air is nitrogen, 80%. So you know the mass of material above you, it's corresponding to 100 uh, and 1 kilopascals. And so at 1 kilogram per cubic meter, we did the calculation, it's about 10 to the 4 cubic meters tall, 10 to the 4 meters tall. And if you know what the molar weight of it, uh, an Avogadro's number is, you can calculate how much is in the column right above us, and then you just multiply by the surface of the Earth to figure it out. So an, e an easy calculation to do, uh, but one that we won't do here. So when we did this integration here, you'll remember that the integration we did was to integrate pressure on one side and integrate elevation on the other side. We assumed that the temperature is constant. But the temperature, of course, is not necessarily constant, and we might want to take it inside there. If we do that, I won't go through the calculation, but here is the calculation. It's in your books also. You can do the same calculation where you integrate the pressure. So this is just taking the change in pressure with elevation is equal to rho g. This rho is equal to pressure divided by rt. So that's all we did here. And so all we're doing is rearranging this to get this expression here, this on the left-hand side, and this on the right-hand side. But instead of taking the temperature as being constant, we keep that in the integration. And the rationale for doing that is that you know when you go up in an airplane, it gets colder. If you feel the uh, window at, at uh, 30,000 feet, it's probably minus 60 degrees uh, centigrade, as it's sh shown here. 10,000 meters, about 30,000 feet. 36,000 feet, I guess, is... Uh, 33,000 feet would be 10,000 meters, I think. No, that's not right. 30,000 30, feet is about 10,000 meters. And so it turns out that the expression that gives us pressure at any location relative to atmospheric pressure at sea level is this, where instead of getting rid of the temperature or the temperature being constant, 
we have the temperature at sea level included in this integration, but also the fact that the temperature changes according to elevation. And so this is just a function, a linear function of height. And so when z is equal to zero, this would equal atmospheric temperature, which is something like 20 degrees centigrade. Let's call it 20 degrees C. If it's equal to minus 60 at uh, what height? Plus z equals 10 kilometers, which is 10 to the 3. Then the change, so the units of this have to be temperature. This is elevation, so this must be temperature per elevation. So beta must have units equal to change in temperature with elevation, which in this particular case, the change in temperature between these is minus 80 centigrade, divided by 10 to the 3 meters. which is about equal to um, 0 0.08 degrees centigrade per meter, right? So what we said about units and dimensionality obviously applies here. And so what we could do is we could calculate exactly what this pressure change with elevation is just by plugging it into this expression. So remember what that expression looks like. I guess this is it here. Cancel. Whoops. Don't save. I think it's this one here. I'm just going to do the calculation. So let's make it big enough so you can actually see it. So pressure at some location. Pressure on the 10 to the 5. Pascals is 100, 100 kilopascals. Elevation zero, that's the pressure at ground zero. Temperature at sea level, 273 plus 15 degrees. So instead of 20 degrees, 15 degrees is the temperature actually on that graph. So it has to be an absolute temperature, has to be absolute pressure. Gas constant, um, gravitational acceleration, the change in Temperature with height is 0 0.008, I guess. Did I do that wrong? Was it 80 divided by 10 to the... Oh, it's 10 kilometers. It's not 10 to the 3, right? It's 10 to the 4 meters. So 80 deg 75 degrees centigrade divided by 10,000 is this. So I was off by one number. And here's the expression we derived on Monday. And I can make it larger, actually, as well. And here's the expression that is modified for this value of beta, which varies with uh, elevation. So let me do this. All right. And this now is a plot of that relationship, if I can get it on the screen. So we're look used to seeing it a little more differently, a little differently. So what is this? This is elevation. So the horizontal axis is height. Sea level, the pressure at sea level is 100, 100 kilopascals. As you go up, we drew it on the other side of the graph, but as you go up, the pressure slowly goes down to some number. It's capped here at 20 kilopascals. And the two ones are the pressure change if you assume that the temperature remains constant is the blue one. And the pressure change, if you assume that it gets colder as you go higher up, is the red one. And they don't differ very much. So we can calculate what it is, but it doesn't make much difference. And so in most cases, we can probably get away with using the very simple expression that assumes the temperature is constant. So changing pressure, changing temperature doesn't make much, much difference. Okay? So if we go back, so... That was uh, the only point I wanted to make. Where's this? So we can use that to calculate the, how pressures change with elevation. Uh, we started off talking about a balloon. Of course, if I go back to this figure here, this is what we just looked at. 
this is the, the curve we just looked at. 100 kilopascals at sea level, zero kilopascals as you go out into outer space. Um, but actually there's a temperature inversion here, which is kind of strange here. I'm not sure exactly what that is. I'm not sure why temperature changes as we go up in the atmosphere, but then it goes back to basically zero centigrade. It may be that it's latent heat changes by things uh, condensing and vaporizing in the atmosphere, but I'm not sure. So, kind of curious. And of course, the reason that a balloon goes up, uh, we haven't given it as much thought here as otherwise, is that if we look at the density of a gas, it's equal to pressure divided by gas constant times temperature. If you want a balloon to go up in the atmosphere, as we saw today, there are, a couple, there are probably three things you can do to it. You want it to have a density which is less than the atmosphere at any particular point, right? It's like um, the fluids in your salad dressing. The oil always floats to the top in vinegar because it's less dense than the other components. So we want the fluid within a balloon to be less dense than the fluid which is outside that. This is just my notation. So if we want the fluid in the balloon to be less dense, we can do a couple of things. We can increase the temperature of the gas in the balloon. It becomes less dense, it rises. We can decrease the pressure in the balloon. Not very practical because the balloon collapses. It can't sustain that drop in pressure, so that probably doesn't work very well for us. Or we can change the density by using a different gas, like helium. And so in the particular example we looked at, I'm sure what they did was they used helium as a, a different gas. You could use hydrogen as well. Sometimes that ends badly, as you know, Hindenburg being the, the watchword for that. Um, but we can use a less dense gas. So those are the three things you can do. Use a less dense gas by changing R um, with a higher gas constant, increasing the temperature, or by reducing the pressure. Not very practical to reduce the pressure. All right? All right, so that's all we wanted to talk about in terms of uh, recap and a bit further beyond from where we were. <clears throat> so the other thing that we can use fluids for is to measure pressures. And we can measure um, pressures by using what's called manometry. And so the way that we'll do that, this is just a recap of the things we've done is maybe the, the, the best example is to use a, a barometer. And so we have another video here somewhere, if I can find my browser. I'm interested in the comments that were on this uh, actual browser. One of the comments is, uh, the only video on YouTube which shows real mercury barometer. Of course, no one likes to use mercury anymore because it scurries around on the floor when you drop it on the floor and is a bit toxic and carcinogenic as well I think right millimeters long and I've filled it with mercury almost to the top and I'm going to finish filling it so that I get filled all the way to the very top and then I'm going to put my finger over the end and I'm going to invert it into the mercury I'm going to set it here and use our clamp to hold it. Now, what's keeping this mercury column so high? It's that atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury. Pushing. And what I have here is a glass tube that's about 800 millimeters long. And I've filled it with mercury <laughs> almost to the top. Now I'm going to finish filling it so that I get... Build Don't do this at home, of course. To the very top. And then I'm going to put my finger over the end, and I'm going to invert it into the mercury. I'm going to set it here and use our clamp to hold it. Now, what's keeping this mercury column so high? It's that atmospheric pressure. Yeah, okay. So you put your thumb over the end of it. You can do it with water as well. Turn it upside down. It drops away from the top, and so what's happening is that the weight of the mercury is pulling down, and it's cavitating. It's, it's vaporizing the mercury at the top, and so in the top there's a vapor, and that vapor, because originally there's nothing but mercury in the tube, is purely uh, mercury vapor. 
And so we can use that and what we've known about the fluid pressures that we've talked about today to be able to understand exactly what the pressure would be and how we can get that from the mercury barometer. And so the construction is basically this. We said already that we know that the two things, dp dx is equal to zero, which is merely saying that if we start out at this point here and we go to this point here, they're the same elevation, so the pressures have to be the same. So immediately what we can do is we can cut off this tube here and think of it as a tube that is closed at the top. If I can draw this. It's closed at the top and it merely has atmospheric pressure acting here. Well. And that therefore we should be able to do something. So this is this expression here that we've used to do that, that we can cut this off. The other expression we have is that dp is equal to minus rho g dz, both partials or it doesn't matter, they can be ordering differentials. And so this is just our expression that the pressure is equal to p0 plus unit weight times height. This, is a, this, this expression comes exactly from this. So what we can do is we can use this to be able to calculate exactly what atmospheric pressure is if we know what the pressure in here is. If we know this is the vapor pressure of vapor, which is close to being zero, then what we could do is that we could calculate merely that P atmosphere, I'm just going to write the same thing. If we're going up in height, it's negative. Unit weight times height is equal to P vapor. This is the easiest way to think about it. We start off at this point here. We know that the atmospheric pressure is atmospheric. We start off here. If we go up a certain height, we know that the pressure is going to change by a change in pressure. That pressure is going to be equal to the change in height, plus h, times the unit weight, because the pressure is going to go down as we go up, right? Because it's getting less material above us. And so this is this, and this has to be equal to, once we get here, equal to this vapor pressure. If we know that the vapor pressure is basically equal to zero for mercury, it's very small. If we know the unit weight of mercury, anyone know the unit weight of mercury? Uh, the density of mercury, I think, is approximately equal to 13 times the density of water. I don't know the exact number. So if that's the case, then that would be 13,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And so if we do the calculation, uh, the only thing that we know here, we know that atmospheric pressure is equal to uh, 10 to the 5 kPa. We could rearrange that in terms of H, and what we would, would we get, we would get that the height is equal to atmospheric pressure divided by the unit weight of mercury, which is equal to 10 to the 5 newtons per meter squared divided by, I'm, I'm going to write it incorrectly, as 10 meters per second squared. This, of course, is equal to rho, rho g or G rho, rather. This is G, and density is 13,000 kilograms per meter cubed, which is the same as 10,000 <coughs> divided by 130,000. Extra zero. Sorry, extra zero on the top too, right? 100,000, right? So it's roughly um, 1 over 13 meters. You can check the units. 
and I don't think it's written down here. So it's a so one over thirteen. I think is about zero point. Someone want to do the calculation? It's about. Um, One, one over one point one over one. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. Yeah, right. So I'm off by a zero here, right? Zero point seven meters. Yeah. And what's the, what's the actual decimal? Seven seven six. About close enough. Okay. Meters of mercury. So that's it. So that's its standard well, atmospheric pressure. We know varies by ten percent, right? It can be one hundred one kilopascals, but it can also be uh, 90 if you're in the middle of a hurricane, the eye of a hurricane. Okay? So that's the, the, the basic calculation to, to be able to do if you want to calculate barometric pressure. And that's how you determine it. And it's predicated on two things. One is that we know that the pressure here is the vapor pressure of mercury, which we can calculate, which is almost zero compared to the other numbers we're looking at. And the other thing is the height of the column of mercury. Why do we use mercury? Yeah, two reasons. One, it's really dense, so you don't really need a big column. If it's a column of water, it's going to be 13 times larger. Uh, so that's going to be, a, it's about um, 24 feet, I think, right, if, if you do the, the, the math. And also, mercury has a very low vapor pressure, almost zero. Uh, water, if you used it, has a higher one. And so, if you use a big tube. Use a big tube that's big enough so it doesn't. Good, good point. It depends on temperature, but also, no, it depends on the material. It just depends on the material. Yeah, liquid, whatever the liquid is. It's the transition between liquid and gas. It's just where it goes across that band. All right, so that's that. Um, what else? Of course, no one wants to use mercury these days. Um, so that's one way to calculate... Uh, uh, pressures. So in general, we'll use manometry. And so there are a number of rules that you'll want to use. And I guess they're written out here. So here are the manometry rules. I'll just talk through them. Uh, they're written on the first page of our stuff today, which we didn't really focus on. Uh, and well, let me go to that first page because they're written much more compactly. So this is the at the beginning of each class. We kind of have this little crib sheet. I've written over these a little bit, but you can see them right here. Pressure measurement manometry. Manometer rules. If you go up in a column, you subtract the pressures. We just did that. We started off at the bottom of the column of mercury, went up. We subtracted off the pressures as we went up. If you go down in the column, pressures increase. You know in a swimming pool, so we add. So those are the first two components. We know that if we go horizontally in a fluid the pressures at those elevations are the same. If we can get to one point to the other in the same fluid, that's important. <clears throat> if the cavity is evacuated, as it was at the top of our manometer, it's the vapor pressure. We held it upside, we held it one way up, thumb across it, turn it upside down. The weight of it cavitated it. It, it failed at intention, if you like. And so it's a vacuum, uh, it's, sorry, it's vapor pressure at the top. There's a vapor sitting on top of the, the liquid. And finally, if we go up and down in a gas, we can usually assume that the unit weight compared to a liquid is basically zero. And that is that last term is predicated on this observation that we drew here, in that this slope of this curve relative to this curve, if you drew it to scale, we know that the slope of this at sea level is one kilogram. The density is one kilogram, so it's, uh, and this is a thousand kilograms. So the slope of this is one thousandth of the slope of that. So if we drew this to scale, this would look like this, and this red one would basically look like this. And so the change in pressure as you go up within a gas is trivial. If you go up a meter in a gas, it's basically the same pressure as here compared to going a meter up in a liquid which would be very different. So those are the, the, the so-called manometer rules. And those are the ones that are written out on this rather scaggy uh, sheet here. So subtract 
um, when you go up, add pressures when you go down. Um, if you're using atmospheric pressure, it, it matters. Uh, you have to do all your calculations in either atmospheric pressure or gauge pressure. It doesn't matter which one, but you have to be aware of it. If the vessel's closed, then you can use the vapor pressure. And when you're measuring the pressure of a gas, we don't care about the density because compared to the liquids in the system, it's trivial. Okay. So we've got 10 minutes or so. Let's use those to do an example. So very, very straightforward. So, yeah, simple question here. So the question is, what's the pressure at point A? How do we calculate that? We have a manometer that has a gas at point A. Well, it doesn't need to be a gas. It could be any fluid. And we want to know what the magnitude of the pressure is here relative to a known magnitude here. So what we'll do is we'll assume that we know atmospheric pressure and we'll calculate the pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. And so all we do is we start off at point, should we call this point B, pressure B. So we start off at PB. We go down in the fluid. So we're going to add pressures plus 5 meters times the unit weight of the gauge fluid, Hg. Because this red fluid is this. Well, we have to go down more. So to get to this point here, we have to go another 2 meters. Whoops. Times the unit weight of the mercury. So we're now at this point. Now we can get to this point to this point by going only through the same fluid. So that's the pressure here. And now we want to get to this point here. So I could do it. We're going to go up 2, up 5, up 5, and then down 5 and down 5. So instead I could just go up 2. Just make life easier. So I could do it, I guess, as uh, minus 2 plus 5 plus 5. That gets me to this point here. And then minus 5 minus 5. I'm probably making things more complicated than I need to, right? You can tell me. Does it matter what level you're at the gas? No, it doesn't. Uh, well, I guess I said gas, but it isn't, right? That's my mistake, yeah. And so this is H2O. And this is equal to PA. And so we know that if we work in gauge pressures, then this is equal to zero. We can look at these, and of course we can throw these away. And we can do this. 5 meters times the unit weight of mercury plus... 2 meters times, well, are you writing this? I'm just going to make it easier. 5 plus 2 times the unit weight of mercury. And this is going to be minus 2 times the unit weight of H2O. And that's it. So we know this is zero. We know this is seven times the unit weight of mercury. We know this is two times the unit weight of water. The unit weight of water is uh, 9.81 kilonewtons per meter cubed, which is just, as you know, 9.81 times 1,000 kilograms. meters per second squared multiplied by a thousand kilograms per meter cubed and we know that mercury is 13 times that or something right so we know that so we know everything here to be able to calculate the pressure and it turns out to be whatever it is and so I think the calculation that's done below here is just a bit well, it's actually the, exactly the same calculation 
It always is easiest, I think, to start with the pressure you know. This pressure we know is zero kPa atmospheric in terms of gauge. If we want to do it, so this is gauge pressures. If we wanted to do it in absolute, it would be exactly the same calculation, except this first term would be 101 kPa. All the other terms would be exactly the same. 7 times the unit weight of mercury minus 2 times the unit weight of water. And then the value of, of, of Pa that we get at that point would be in absolute pressures as well. So I'm guessing that in this case, yeah, the pressure in here is larger than atmospheric just because of this differential pressure here, just by looking at it. Uh, you can, and in fact, if you see the answer here, atmospheric pressure, this is done in gauge pressures, and so this is 900 kPa. So the pressure in terms of gauge pressure is nine, uh, 911. In terms of absolute pressures, you have to add 101 kilopascals onto this. So it would be 1,000 and, yeah, just over 1,000 kilopascals. OK? Say it again. If this was a vapor in here, then A would be equal to the vapor pressure, and we'd have two. If this one? If that was closed and we did what we did with the mercury, turning it upside down, then it would be vapor pressure, yeah. Where is PA in that diagram? PA is right here in the middle at this mid midpoint. Um, okay, so there's, and there's some other examples. So, yeah, so those are the rules, just applying the rules. Um, you could imagine, you know, just as a parting shot, we've got one minute. Uh, this is used, manometry is used to measure pressures. It's often used to measure pressures between components, such as between two pipelines going into the page. And because you measure the relative height difference between the two components, I guess what you'd find in this case is that the pressure is given merely by this height here, which is 7 meters. So if you went through here, um, you'd find out, well, almost 7 meters. No, that's not quite true there. Because you're measuring this difference in height between these two, if there's a way to actually resolve that in an easier way, then you could get a more accurate reading. And so one way to do that would use an inclined manometer where instead of having a U-tube with a vertical pipe, you just put it on its side, and you can measure the location of this meniscus somewhere along this, and you can just use cosine rule to be able to figure out exactly what that elevation change is, because you can measure the meniscus location much more accurately. And so we'll leave it at that.